G'day YouTube. Warbles on a lot here. Welcome to the 20mm Mark II Model S. Irrigation sprinkler on a sled. I found using this at ground level, you get a 12 metre radius. 24 metres diameter circle. The outside of the circle is watered by the 4.9 millimetre green jet. And it, as you can see, leaves the sprinkler at a 30 degree angle to the horizontal. And it comes out quite fast and it goes in a ballistic curve and it lands at about a 30 degree downward trajectory assuming you've got a perfectly flat level piece of ground to water. I found that by mounting the sled on top of a tripod, still in the horizontal position, I could increase the diameter from 24 metres out to pretty near 30 metres. Maybe it was from 26 to 30. I didn't actually measure it that closely, not with a tape measure. I paced it. But the fact is, the water went further and instead of landing or impacting the ground at a 30 degree angle, it was impacting at a 45 degree angle. So I figured what I really needed to do is to put a sprinkler at the top of the power line tripod. And then I should be rewarded by a flow of water which reaches out 15 meters. and descends vertically out of the sky. So at 15 metres, then that sprinkler, it should in theory instill air I know from up there on top of the power line tripod, it should be able to water all the way out past the edge of the hut. To the 15 meter mark. So I kind of sort of spent half the weekend figuring out various ways I could go about mounting one of those sleds about 15 feet off the ground uh, up above the top of the tower. And then it occurred to me, I really don't need all that ironmongery. What I need is a sprinkler head with a connection coming vertically up into its base. And I need to mount that on top of the tower. So I then spent about a day thinking that I'll wait for the shop to open and I'll go into the irrigation warehouse and I'll just ask them for a 20 millimeter sprinkler head because that's what I've got because that's what I'm used to. And I know that it'll work. Uh, and the connections to come home and hook it up to a fire hose at one end and have it on top of the uh, the power line tripod. But then I thought, hang on, whoa back. I'm the bloke doing this for the first time. They are the people who make a living out of selling this stuff. So instead of telling them what I wanted to buy, I told them what I wanted to do which was to get as much water coming out of the sprinkler head from that position, taking into account how far vertically it is to the pump at the dam, 480 metres away. And therefore, instead of coming home with a 20 millimetre Mark II Model S, what I came home with 
was a 25 millimeter or one inch Toro Monsoon, which has 5.6 instead of 4.9 millimeter main jet, and I think 4.2 instead of 3.9 for the smaller jet. It's exactly 20% bigger. It's heavier, but it's supposed to do a 33 meter diameter circle and running on the dam pump, it should do 50 liters a minute. So it'll go further and put out the same amount of water. And it's up higher, so the water should descend vertically from out of the sky over. A 16 and a half metre radius, meaning that the wet dome, instead of finishing roughly here, with the 15 metre mark <coughs> indicated by the piece of scrap metal, all the way out to there. And when I tried it last night, yeah, it worked. <clears throat> but probably the second surprise of the flight test, so to speak, was that instead of giving me a curtain that was 16 and a half meters radius, plus or minus a meter sort of thing, the light breeze we had last night pushed the downwind side out to 22 and a half meters so yeah it gets shifted a long way according to the breeze <clears throat> so the old sled running on the firefighting pump here in the clearing it's getting me 60 liters an hour so i'm assuming that because the old sled gives me 50 liters an hour maybe 55 with the dam pump this one should probably give me 55 to 60 litres an hour, although right at the shop said running on the dam, it'll probably give 50 litres an hour. Okay, he's probably going to be right. I don't know. We'll find out. But the big surprise is that as much as I did to try and make this thing rigid, <coughs> sadly, I didn't make it rigid enough because it turns out that these things rely on taking kinetic energy out of the distance jet, diverting some of that kinetic energy into changing the direction of the jet for a brief period of time, which means that the reaction to the water jet changing direction after it's left the nozzle is to impart a lateral movement to the diverter. The diverter's got a mass balance on the other end of it and it's got a spring to restrict its movement. So the energy taken out of the water stream in diverting the water gets itself stored in the spring and then the spring brings the diverter nozzle back into the stream and as it comes back into the stream, the mass balance bashes this rotatable sprinkler head which has a careful little washer and a spring and a drag brake set up on it so that a particular amount of force delivered by the clack clack weight so to speak each clack causes it to move a particular amount and all of these calculations rely on the base of the sprinkler being rigidly mounted and despite having a meter and a half of aluminium which do the channel stitch to it. It can rapidly get itself into a harmonic situation when it's doing that. And when it's doing that, the energy required to wobble the setup
comes out of the system that's designed to rotate the sprinkler. So instead of going around once a minute, it might take five minutes to get around the circle once, which is kind of irritating to observe. It's not the way it's supposed to work. So therefore, Muggins here has to pull the damn thing back down and remake it so that it's going to be stiff -er. Because that is not acceptable. The worry is, I think I'm going to have to add rigidity to the tower as well as to the piping. I'll try just fixing the piping and hanging the rigid piping balanced on top of the tower. But yeah, I think I'm going to have to add more triangulation. But anyway, just to get myself a frame of reference, before I pull it down and start it working or start working on it, I think I'm going to have a go at capturing a little bit of video of just how much the bloody thing wobbles. So wait here while I go and start the pump and connect it up. Okay, I've framed it to show the worst of the wobble on full telephoto. Just watch this. As you can see, it's got the wobblies. Got the wobbly something fierce. I initially thought it wasn't progressing at all. But it is. Very, very slowly. And we have dam water running off into the bucket. And that's just from the fill-in spray. The main jet hasn't got here yet. Three minutes after we started. And bugger, this is the hole with the pinhole, hose with the pinholes. I don't think that thing's actually progressing at all. But I have identified the problem and I reckon I can fix it. And I reckon I can fix it without pulling it down too. And that's bloody good. I'll have to mark that. Right. The wobbling knock the light bulb off the solar light. I don't reckon it rotated at all. We have water drops level with the back of the hut from the fill-in spray. 
out of the 3.9 millimeter, uh, 4.2 millimeter nozzle. Couple of drops in a bucket at the 16 meter mark over here. And a damn water diversion bucket. So I haven't got to drink the stuff which I thought of doing today and didn't think of doing yesterday, so I am going to have to put up with some. But it's alright, I boil all that water before I drink it anyway. Yeah, it's probably picked up 15 litres off the sprinkly side of the roof from the back spray, the fill-in spray. Whereas the main jet headed out into the wind was wetting my car. Uh, and yeah, getting out to here, which is pretty much your 16 metres. So all i got to do now is stiffen that thing and make it properly rotate. I tell you, a hillbilly's work is never done. It just goes on and on and on. Anyway, I'm going to try the quick fix now. Okay. Well, as I said, I think uh, despite the fact that I've stiffened the pipe where it interfaces with the tower it may be the fact that the tower has such a long unstayed terminal cellule i think what i might have to do is uh come from here up to about here perhaps here put a triangle across there and diagonals in because at the moment you can barely wriggle that the whole tower wriggles and the movement transfers itself up there however you can wriggle the entire tower and that makes what's on top wriggle even more so I guess it's all going to come down to uh, whether the sprinkler can move <coughs> in response to its actuating masses before the tower wriggles and wobbles and the compression torsion wave reflects off the ground and goes back up and wriggles the head the other way the only way to find out so i guess i'll leave the camera here on the tripod okay connected up pumps running i'll go and switch it on and we will see what happens Well, it still wriggles, but it is progressing around the circle, slowly. You can see by the wriggling and the jiggling of the power cord. And uh, if we come across here, you 
and you can see the little light fitting jiggling. However, it is in fact working, Kimo Sabi. And I'm getting pissed on right here, quite significantly pissed on actually. Right? So far, nothing yet over on this side of the hut. There has been some runoff, which I'll tip out. I can hear water landing on the shed now. And as I expected and hoped and foretold, it waters the outside walls of the shed because this stuff is in fact coming down pretty close to vertical. It all seems to hinge on how much wind there is. Quite interesting watching these spray patterns. And of course the runoff is sort of beyond capacity of that to measure. I'm trying not to get the damn water into me drinking water. Not a hell of a lot out here at the 16 metre mark, but it's all sort of dependent. Doesn't seem to be wriggling around as much now. And yeah,
how far it goes and where it goes all depends greatly on whether there's any wind at all but yeah here we're probably closer to 20 meters than we are to 16. And it looks like 10 minutes. To make one sweep. And yeah, it rains pretty hard while it's making that one sweep. And the wind seriously affects where the droplets go. Yeah. Some silly mongrel forgot to close the door to his hut. So it might have uh, got rained on, on the inside. I'd have to say that's a kind of a qualified success. But if you check it out, it's the entire bloody tower that's wobbling. So I think that's going to be my next trick is to stiffen the tower. We're just about finally coming up to a full circle. And that's like the wind convergence, divergence zone in the trees. Love the way you can actually visualize the hydrology. And yeah, it all depends on the strength of the wind and the direction and where it's all going. Yeah, the car started getting wet, and now it's getting wet again. I think some of the forwards and backwards motion might actually have to do with the harmonics of the torsion wave going up and down the tower because sometimes it advances fairly rapidly and sometimes it doesn't sometimes it points its flow low and sometimes it points its flow high yeah i'm getting piddled on here
So yeah, it's as it was foretold within the prophecy. The rain, or the water falls down vertically out of the sky, just like rain, and it wets down the ground right up to the edge on the far side of the aeroplane trailer. Not all the way to the nose. But it gets all this difficult to wet down area in here. Might have to do something about some of these overhanging trees, but in the fullness of the time, that sprinkler there, it's wetting down even into the mouth of the workshop. Right, so that's 15 minutes and it's now starting on its second evolution. Quite a project. It does indeed get water on the ground on the far side of the machinery shed. It, it wets down the sawn timber stock file. Hey, what do you think of that, Missy? Your pet tame human's been human has been being clever again. Yeah. So it rains all the way out to here. fighting against a bit of westerly wind. Sort of shows the density pattern. Yeah. I think that's a bit of a success. It means I can then lay out three tripods. And the three tripods can go on the upwind side of this wet dome. And then I can uh, lay out my fire hoses and deal with whatever ember attack succeeds in getting a hold. But yeah, here we have the stuff that I did not want getting into my drinking water. So, all told, I'm pretty happy with that. And now the bottom of the bucket has got a little bit of water in it.
Okay. I make that 20 minutes plus 5 minutes earlier on this morning and 15 minutes yesterday. 45 minutes. And yeah, until I get 6 extra, di well, 3 extra diagonals and 3 extra horizontal stays to rigiditize the tower. I think that's kind of acceptable. It'll probably go around faster once I give it a more rigid base, but in the meantime, that's how much water there was in the pipe. Put that down there. the pipe out. Watering a different tree every time. And now of course having got that thing to work more or less after a fashion on the pump. Did you enjoy that little sun shower? Which apparently didn't quite make it all the way into the hut. It really is a well-mannered setup, particularly if I can take the last little bit of the whippiness out of the tower. So today we used 18 centimetres of water times 98.3 litres yeah, 1.68 tonnes, added on to yesterday's and nearly 3 tonnes, 31 minutes of pumping up is going to have to be done. Okay fellas, you keep an eye on the clearing, while I will set the top end up and take the coffee cup off to visit the pump. on what is becoming now almost a well-worn track. And happily, everything's all still here, except that the water level was half a centimetre above the level of that white line last time I was here. So I'd say kind of two centimetres of water, which is four tonnes, has evaporated. Um, golly gosh. And I'm going to take three tonnes out of it now. So I might have to move the pump back down after this. And that's a bit sad, but I want to be sitting on 15 tonnes of water in the clearing. But anyway, that's a job for another day. This mission is to pump up. So we start it up. And we warm it up. And we throttle up. And we start pumping on the hour. And in 31 minutes, the top tank should be full. I'm going to go up there and see what happens. Because after filling the top tank, the plan is to test the new Toto Monsoon on its still slightly shaky, wibbly wobbly mount. Although, as the water from the monsoon soaks into the wood of the tower, the wood will expand as it rehydrates and then all of its joints will tighten up so hopefully it won't wobble as much when wet as it did when it was dry 
time will tell. But yeah, if the whole idea of that sprinkler is to run it on dam water while using the water in the tanks and the firefighting pump in the clearing to run the other sprinkler and two fire hoses, then I think I'd probably better see how well the Aquarius Project dam pump can drive the Toro monsoon. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Kind of funny the way in the middle of the afternoon on a sunny day this pipe has developed a whole lot of zigzags and snakies that it really didn't have even though I set it up originally on a sunny day but it was a cooler sunny day and yeah it has migrated downhill a little bit but I'm pretty sure that's because of linear expansion of the warm pipe with the sun warmed water than because of any vibration plus gravity induced downhill migration but that is merely a speculation here's one of these straight out of nowhere type discursions which I certainly didn't put there when I laid the pipe hello prospector and the sister two not just the one of you Now, if they were over at the hut, I could walk between them. And they wouldn't move if they were eating or they thought I had treat food for them. This far from the hut, well, you saw, five metres, perhaps eight metres, and off they went. No answer was the stern reply, so I've got to go down and find out what happened. Maybe some dumb prick didn't turn the fuel on. Yeah, the dumb prick didn't turn it on, all right, didn't turn it on at this end. Okay, so that's eight minutes worth of pumping. Kind of wasted. Uh, impeller pressure uh, temperature would have been 40 degrees. When I turned that on, happily, not enough to have damaged it. Otherwise, probably wouldn't be pumping at the moment. Which it emphatically is. I should learn to read the bloody legend on the handle. Obviously I'd already set that thing up open. And then on camera I cleverly closed it. So, take about three minutes before any actual evidence other than a complete blockage and stoppage arrives at this end. And that evidence would probably be, here we go, cavitation coming through. long as the output doesn't fill up with uh, sump oil.
387 litres in the pipeline at 93.8 litres a minute. Oh, the joys of playing around with making water go uphill. Righto, I think it's all going to be fine. Hey ho, up she rises. And now I get to sit and drink my coffee in comfort, in the shade. Ah. For about 15 minutes, 20 minutes, while waiting for the pump to fill up that tank. Oh. Hoppities have fresh water. Clay fighting. In all their dishes. And look at that. Assuming I turned it on at uh, 15.08, then 15.39 is a pretty good guess. If it was actually 100 litres a minute, but it's kind of not, it's only 93.8, so yeah. And of course, when the water transfer stops, when the water gets to the grey line, which it actually already is just over here, so therefore, close that one down and bring out our soft transfer pipe and then bring our transfer pipe over to here and then rather than asking the pump to grind away for another six or seven minutes maybe eight minutes while I'm walking down there we will finally give it I go at the sprinkler. At fifteen forty three. And yeah, it's still wobbling, but it's also not wobbling perfectly in phase with itself, therefore it is progressing around the circle. And I do believe it's perhaps because of the lower water pressure. Also perhaps because, as I said, the wood of the tower will have soaked up some water and swollen, become somewhat larger and therefore all the tie wires will have become tighter. But yeah, I think it's uh, it's progressing in rotation faster now than it was. So yeah. Yeah, and it's still pretty much going out to 20 metres on that side.
Yeah. Okay. So that's only about three or four minutes to the circle. And now, leaving that to do its thing. Yeah, that's just one pass on the bucket. And yeah, wet out to here. Ah. I do declare that is a clever trick. Wobbles, that is a clever trick. How's that for a rain dance, eh? From little things. Big things grow. Gotta go. Jump cut. Sorry, can't resist. Check out this wet feathery edge. Now, jump cut. Well, as it was foretold within the prophecy, I've just taken three and a half tons out, and three and a half tons, three and a half thousand litres if you want to look at it that way, it's about equivalent. There's something like six days worth of evaporation, seven days worth of evaporation. So the sooner my next door neighbour's solar powered bore pump comes online, the sooner I'll be able to siphon water from my tank back down here. Because I surely do owe the dam some water back. At this stage, I think about 10 tonnes. And in my eagerness to play with the sprinkler, guess who forgot to bring the fuel can. So that will be another trip for tomorrow morning. So, not an entirely perfect day's water carrying, but I'm fairly happy with it as I sit here on Contemplation Rock. With the sun on me back as I survey my vast holdings.
of the precious element, dihydrogen monoxide. And the answer to global warming and tropogenic fossil fuel drought is clearly burn more fossil fuels. Just have to excuse the flies on the lens. I think that's what it was. And at the moment, the Toro monsoon is functional. Not perfect. As I said, I'm going to have to rigiditize the tower to make it work any better than it does, but it's twice as good now as it was this morning. So I'll, I'll take that as a win. <coughs> Smooth. Yeah, I'll take that as a win, such as, as it is. And sadly, now I have to toddle on. And there's really only one more thing to check. After this morning's effort, 25 minutes, there was one and a half millimeters in the rain gauge one and a half millimetres of dam water in the rain gauge. Um, I put out 1.6 tonnes to achieve that 1.5 millimetres. So mm, either, and that's the other thing, I know it was putting out 67 litres a minute. Uh, so that possibly means that by elevating up to four and a half metres, I've increased the 870 square metres to a, a pretty close to the neat thousand square metres of watered area. So, yeah. 1.6 tonnes on the thousands, on, on thousand square metres. Maybe it's even more than that. Maybe about 1,100 square metres. Because, yeah, it, it should have been one point six millimetres for 1.6 tonnes. And the sprinkler sitting at ground level was rated at 870 square metres. So yeah, we've, we've, we've pushed the watered area, the wet dome, so to speak. I've pushed it up to about 1,100 square metres. Maybe... I don't know, something like that. Have to do it in still air at the centre, midday and all the rest of it. Haven't really got the water to nail it down any closer than that. I'm going to go with 1,100 square metres. Upon which I can make it rain dam water. And with this set up, probably for about four hours as long as I refuel the pump at the halfway mark. After which time the fire front will probably have passed and I can switch the pumps off. At least that's the grand plan. It may not be a perfect fire plan. It may not be an unbeatable fire plan. And at this stage it all sort of hinges on how hard the wind blows. If the wind blows hard enough it can blow a fire under the canopy so you don't actually get a canopy fire I've seen that happen but it was 25 years ago and the canopy concerned wasn't full of dead leaves but yeah in order to stop a bushfire in a really really strong wind we lit a backburn on the understanding that the flames would not rise high enough to light the canopy we did it at night and it worked and that was the first time I ever went out with the fire, you know, the rural fire service or the bushfire council it was back in those days. Long time ago. So anyway, 
if the wind is just the perfect strength for pushing an actual flame front uh, and if the hot gases stay kind of low down close to the ground then there's not much you can do you're just going to have to run away and I accept that but if you got light breeze and a fire up wind and you're dealing with ember attack then being able to put five or ten millimeters of rain onto a thousand square meters that you're trying to defend and having one fixed and one mobile sprinkler plus two live fire hoses to deal with an ember attack is pretty good as far as options go I know one couple have been killed in the fires recently about 100 kilometers north of here they were trying to shelter in a building well I know better than to try that here because my buildings are sheet metal they'll work like an oven pick up radiant heat from outside transmit it to the center better off watering the building and hiding on the other side of it and use the building as a barrier against radiant heat that's the theory <coughs> and as bad as the fires have been houses have been lost I'm not sure if any houses have been lost where the occupant had 15 tonnes of water in the front yard and a fire pump and three hoses and another fire pump and a dam and a sprinkler. I don't know how many of those sort of situations the house has been lost where the, the occupant was not relying on the fire brigade to show up just because they dialed triple zero. Rudolph the Redneck Reindeer got a big surprise. Rudolph the Redneck Reindeer didn't expect Warbles to be walking along making a video. Um, probably sat there while I walked backwards and forwards past him all bloody day, but I wasn't talking. Anyway. Yeah, let's take the Red Range fire, or Kingsgate fire, which migrated to become the Waitalabar fire. Whole bunch of people, all living just out of sight of each other, at the bottom of gullies. They're just as dry as anybody else. Admittedly, they had a good RFS. Also, the mayor of the town lives there. That's the town of Glen Innes lives on the alternative lifestyle community so yeah they got helicopters and all the rest of it about half the residents evacuated the ones who evacuated tended to be the most recently arrived less sure of themselves I suppose the old timers stuck around if they saw a fire was going towards anybody's house they just went and put it out with the resources they had at hand and they got resources at hand because they live in the bush and they know they've got to have them um, so yeah there's kind of a difference between having a few fire hoses and a couple of pumps and a bit of water and sort of knowing what you're doing because you've done it for 25 years and just living in the scrub and hoping like hell that it's never going to happen here When it all comes down to it, on a bad day, the fire brigades stop actively fighting the fire. Well, I'm not, none of this is designed to actively fight a bushfire. They withdraw from active firefighting and they go back to property protection. And if that means one fire truck picks one house and does their level best to stop that house from burning, well, that's as good as you can do. If you've got a a category one fire tanker you got three tons of water on it if you got a category seven you got 1.3 tons I'm sitting on two fire pumps 15 tons in the front yard and another I don't know 
25, 30 tons down there at the dam. As soon as I can get bore water with which to water, then I can get the whole oh, 0.56 of a hectare wetted down and do the green oasis thing. In the meantime, on occasion, I can wet down 0.1 of a hectare centered on everything that I'm trying to defend. And I can wet down the surrounding area pretty well. all the way out, literally, past the aeroplane trailer. Right. So before that, probably 10 or 12 minutes, there was 1.6 millimetres in the gauge. And now there is 2 millimetres. I hope that shows. There we go. Right. So that's kind of about right. Right at the irrigation warehouse said that from the dam up there on top of the pole like that this thing would do 50 litres a minute and he said it would go 33 metres diameter but his diameter was based on a flat plane surface sprinkler height of probably not much more than a metre and a half whereas lift the thing four and a half metres or 15 feet up off the ground. This is the water bucket. The dam water, 10 minutes, plus a bit of time for it to evaporate and dry out. And that's the theoretical limit of the range. I'd say it was probably coming out maybe another metre. So 17 and a half meter radius rather than 16 and a half pretty close correlation though two millimeters in the gauge and today i put out 2100 liters through that sprinkler and of course i should be wearing me going to town clothes and i should be just getting out of my car in the main street to go and buy the bread and go and visit the post office and buy the newspaper and stuff like that. But guess what? I got carried away. And not only was I carried away doing it, I was trying to record it. For those few people who want to watch a marathon long movie of warbles on a lot playing with a sprinkler. But, you know, there might be 50 of you. And I thought it was fun, so why not? By this stage of the day, it's beer o'clock. Festive spiced ginger beer o'clock surely this is not an unreasonable decadent petulant narcissistic demand So for those of you who have been organising a sweepstake as to uh, <clears throat> how fast my fire hoses are going to melt when the firestorm finally arrives at my place, 
you're going to have to reorganise and recalibrate your totalisator, aren't you, Capricorn? Wallowing in Schadenfreude as you are. Warbles on a lot to, glow, to YouTube. Have a good one. Global warming is winning, but some of us are planning to fight a few battles and withdraw at the slowest possible speed. And the answer to global warming is burn more fossil fuel in your firefighting pump. This mush is oblivious. But it sure as hell beats living in the towns and the cities and the suburbs. Competing with everybody else to see who can make the most profit in the shortest possible amount of time by trashing what's left of the biosphere faster. Ciao.